And because I forgot to start the recording, I got to start all over. <laughs> oh, the announcements. Thank you. And I say, <laughs> good morning, everybody. Welcome to Trinity Baptist Church. <laughs> Sunday morning service. <laughs> now I got to start this over here. <laughs> hey, we know what we're doing. It just doesn't look like it. All right, back to where I was talking about. Everybody knows what rope's for, right? Well, we're gonna have a knot tying class called Knot Tying 101. All right, that means you're at the bottom level. Can anybody here tie a lot of knots? You know how to tie different kind of knots and you know what they're called and you know what they're used for. Is anybody pretty good at that? Huh? Anybody? Well, my wife and I started fishing again last year, a little bit. We don't, we don't get to go a lot, but we fish some. And I had to relearn how to tie fishing knots, different kinds of knots. There's three or four, five, six, whatever, depends on the fisherman, kind of knots that you can use for different things. <coughs> well, I figured out, I do a lot better with rope than I do fishing line, because I can't see the fishing line. <laughs> so I, I do better tying a rope. I don't know a whole lot of knots, but I know a few. But I'm not going to show off and show you all the knots that I know. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to show you one knot. Okay? And I'm going to teach it to you in just a few minutes. So we're going to have rope tying knots 101 right now. You ready? That's a knot. And that's a hang on to it and don't let go knot. That's what I call it. Now, Tammy, Tammy, yeah. if you ever get in a situation where you're having to hang on to a rope or you're gonna fall off a cliff or fall in the bathtub or fall down a hole or something, you tie your knot in the end of the rope and you hang on, you don't let go. Got that? Yeah. It helps you if you just hang on to the rope without a knot. You start slipping, don't you? You know, your hands get tired and you just can't hold any more. And before we know it, you slide right off the end of the rope. If you put your knot at the end of that rope, you won't slide off nearly as easily. It's a lot easier to hold on, isn't it? It helps, doesn't it? So put your knot in the rope. And then when you, if you need your another knot, you put your another knot in the rope and you just keep adding knots. And you'd be surprised how much help that'll be to you when you're needing to hold on to a rope. Now, what in the world has that got to do with preaching? I'm getting ready to show you. Bible is full of knots. And I'm gonna show you just a few knots in the Bible, okay? Knots to hold on to, just like that. Knots to hang on to. It'll help you. You ready? All right, here we go. With my remote control. I'm really not as scatterbrained as I appear to be. Miss Barbara, I heard that. <laughs> I recognize your laugh. Well, okay, yes, I may be as scatterbrained as I appear to be. <laughs> but not all the time, just when I'm trying to think. That's all. Everybody who knows me knows that my brain is one of those brains that thinks a little bit here and a little bit there, but doesn't in between, doesn't think much. Knot tying 101. The Bible is full of knots that should be in our lives. But you notice the little play on words? It's not K-N-O-T, it's N-O-T. That kind of knot. Bible is full of those kind of knots, okay? You'll turn with me to Genesis chapter 45. I'm going to show you a knot that'll help you. And I'm going to, these are simple, practical, easy, and I'm filling in today with this sermon on knots because I've been saving it. I want to use it for a long time. Uh, this sermon, I believe this sermon, most of it came from my oldest son, Joshua, who's a pastor in Georgia now, but he was at another church, and years ago he gave me this sermon. 
was I, I, I talked to my son and I asked him sometimes, hey, what are you preaching on? What are you going to preach on this Sunday? And he'll say, well, this or that. I'll say, hey, give me that sermon. That sounds good. He makes a lot better sermons than I do. His are, his are long sermons and they're very complicated and I can take one of his points and make a whole sermon out of it. So that's what I did. <laughs> anyway, it's mine now because I've, I've fine-tuned it and made it my own. Fall not. Fall not. The Bible says we are not to fall. Genesis chapter 45 verse 24. Genesis chapter 45 verse 24. You've got to get the setting here. This is Joseph while he is in Egypt, he is serving as the second in command, only he's the next under Pharaoh himself. His brothers have come down from Israel and uh, left their father at home. There's a, a, a drought and all the people are dying and are starving to death. And they've come down to get, to get food and stuff like that from Egypt. And Joseph reveals who he is because he recognizes them. And now he says, go back and get our father and bring him to Egypt so that we can save his life. Because you're starving to death up in Israel, but we've got food here in Egypt because I planned for it. We've got all kinds of corn and grain and all kinds of food. So we're surviving. So I want you to bring my father and all the family, bring all the little ones and come back and live here in Egypt and I'll take care of you. This is the last thing he told them, the instructions he gave them. Chapter 45, verse 24, it says, So he sent his brethren away, and they departed. And he said unto them, See that you fall not out by the way. By the way meant on the trip during this journey. It's a long journey. Do it by foot. It's a long way to go. Make sure you don't fall on the way. Don't fall not out by the way. He said, don't, don't get hurt. Watch out for robbers. Be careful. All of those things. Fall not out by the way. Well, let me apply this same thing he told his brothers to something we can do in our lives today. All right? Very simple. Remember that. One thing I'm sure of is that Many, many people do not have this knot in their life. Many people. They do not have this instruction to fall not out by the way when it comes to God's way in our lives. They're falling out of the way of God and they're falling out of the way God has for them all over the place. Christians, believers, are falling by the wayside getting out of God's will for their life. Young people are giving their lives over to their own desires, to wickedness, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. They're giving their lives over to things of this life instead of giving their life for God. Adults are falling, fall into sin, fall into addictions, fall into the trap of being depressed or hopeless, Churches are falling by the wayside too. They're falling out into contemporary music, changing their Bible versions, versions using perverted Bibles, falling into the trap of, of using rock music because they think it's going to bring in the crowd. And I was telling them in Sunday school this morning, if you fill a church, or was I, I don't remember when I said it, if you fill a church with enough worldliness so that the world feels really comfortable. No, it was just a few minutes ago we were talking about it, wasn't it? You fill a church full of worldliness and wickedness so that everybody feels comfortable sitting there and they don't feel any conviction of the Holy Spirit. Does that honor God? It doesn't bring people to God. It just brings them to a building. That's all it does. There ought to be a difference between Christians and the world. Amen? Yes, we should not be falling out and, and falling away that the world has for us. There's a path 
in life that everybody has, that God has laid out. And then there are all kinds of other paths, all kinds of other choices, all kinds of other options, all kinds of other ways of living that the devil has laid out to get you off that right path. All kinds of them. Now, once you get off the, on the wrong path, it doesn't mean you can't come back. You can always come back because God has always made a way for you to come back. Always. He always has a way for you to come back. That's because God's gracious and loving. But be careful that you don't waste part of your life being on the wrong path. Here we go. The next one. Another knot we need in our lives. We use the word fret, don't we? A fret does not necessarily mean fear. It can. It can. But I want to use it in a different way here. Fret. And I want to use it this way. And I, I, I stole this phrase from my son. It keeps you from being submarined. I had to ask him what in the world does he mean by that. I've never heard of being submarined before. I've heard of being set up. I've heard of being attacked uh, when you're not suspecting it, being surprised. That's kind of what submarine means. You're caught off guard. You're caught off guard. They catch you off guard the way a submarine can do you, right? Sneak up under you, sneak up on you, not see it coming. Well, don't be submarine. Fret not. We're going to talk about worry. Fret and worry. That's the two things I want to connect. Psalm 37 is a beautiful part of the Bible. Psalm 37. And I challenge you, and I'd like to ask you if you have your Bible with you, and I hope you do. If you don't, find one in the pew. Turn to Psalm 37 and look at it with me, okay? Just for a moment. I challenge you, read Psalm 37 at home. Or if you'd rather read it instead of listening to me the rest of the sermon, that's fine too. That's all right with me. I won't get mad. Read Psalm 37. It is filled with wonderful, wonderful God, Jesus, glorifying text. It really is. But it's got good instructions for the Christian too. Don't be attacked by surprise. Don't be ambushed. Don't be set up. Don't be submarined by this problem of not having fret not in your life. Don't be caught in this trap of worry. Worry, worry. Look at verse 1. Psalm 37, verse 1. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. Fret not because of evildoers. Jump down to verse 7. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who uh, purposeth in his way. I read wrong, didn't I? Prospereth in his way. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Verse 8. Cease from anger, forsake and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Those who worry and fret over things will soon become discouraged. Discouraged. Most things are not worth worrying about. For example, if you can't control it, why worry about it? Because worry is not going to fix anything. As a matter of fact, it's going to make it worse. You can't do anything about it. Your worrying is not going to help. It's just going to make it worse. Why fret? Why worry? Now, uh, that's not to say that you shouldn't pay attention to it, put some attention on it, that you shouldn't take care of it. I'm not saying that you just live in this uh, um, life where you just say, oh, I just don't think about anything. No, you should care about it. You should be concerned. But don't spend your days and nights worrying about it. Don't lay awake at night thinking about something that you can't fix. Say, God, it's in your hands. I'm in your hands, and I'm trusting you to help me. 
I'm trusting you to work this out. God may not take that problem away from you. He may leave it right there in your life, but he will help you through it. And he'll deal with it. He'll use it for something good in your life and somebody else's life. Now, I want to show you a special hidden nugget, a treasure in Psalm 37. Okay? Look with me. In verse 1, he says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers. Jump down to verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Notice the phrase, trust in the Lord. Look at verse 4. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Delight thyself also in the Lord. Get hold of that. Verse 5. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Get hold of that phrase. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Go down to verse uh, 7, the first part of the verse. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. We get all that phrase in the first part of the verse. Rest in the Lord. Second, uh, uh, second part of, of, uh, of verse 7, what does he say? Wait patiently excuse me, after the second phrase in verse 7, wait patiently for him. And then, of course, you've got another fret not in verse 8 that we've already read. That, verses 1 through 8, is loaded with all kind of encouragement and source of strength for the believer. He just keeps pointing, look to God, look to God, trust in God, rest in the Lord, cease from your, uh, well, I forgot my words. Anyway, don't fret. Fret not. Don't be caught up in the worry thing. It won't do you any good. It'll just make things worse. We all do it. We've all done it. We all have a problem with it. But don't be caught in it and, and so that you can't get out. Let's go to the next one. Here's an easy one. How about forget not? Forget not. This will help you not become self-righteous. Why? Because you don't want to forget what the Lord has done for you. Psalm 103, starting at verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his all his benefits. Forget not all his benefits. Forget not. You know that little song we sing? Count your blessings, name them one by one. You know why you ought to count your blessings? So you won't forget what God's doing for you, what God has done for you. God is always blessing and working. You know the most grumpy, hard to get along with, miserable people are people who are not thankful. Not thankful. Why are they not thankful? Because they don't remember, they've forgotten what God's done for them, or they don't want to know what God's done for them. They won't look at what God's done. All the blessings God's given them, they won't look. It's important to remember, life is not all about you. It's about God. It's about God. And a lot of people don't like to hear that. But you know why? Because the, to them, it's all about me. It's all about you. It's all about them. That's all they think about, what's important to them. You know, that, that's uh, self-satisfaction can only take you so far, can it? Self-satisfaction, self-glory, self-love. You, you know, when you, when you love yourself, uh, you start looking around for somebody who loves you and you're gonna find out there aren't too many people around because you love yourself so much. If you don't care about others, then not many people are going to care about you. What, what's the, there's, a, there's a principle in the scriptures called reaping and sowing. Right? You reap what you sow. All right, let's keep going. Fear not. Now you say, well, preach, that's the same thing as fret. 
like you said a while ago. Well, not if you do what I said in the net. I ask you a favor to change fret to worry. Now we use the word fear. Did you know that the Bible says 365 times, fear not. Most of you have heard that in your life in church, but maybe some of you didn't. 365 times, fear not, appears in the Bible. 365 times. Huh, 365. One for every day of the year. How about that? God gives you a fear not for every day of the year. Because he said it 365 times in his word. Fear not, though, keeps you from being speechless. We're talking about sharing the gospel and telling others about the Lord. Keeps you from being speechless. Let me show you a little verse about the disciples. When the disciples uh, decided that they were going to uh, be fishermen, Jesus gave them other instructions. All right? Luke chapter 5, verse 10. The verse says, And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. Thou shalt catch men. Jesus called these men to go to leave their fishing. That's how they made a living. Leave their fishing long enough to go out and catch some men for God. Share the gospel of Jesus with them. Now, later on, later on, in the ministry of Christ, and after his death, burial, and resurrection, what did the disciples who had been fishermen, what did they do? They went back to... Huh? They went back to fishing. They went back to fishing, Right? Peter said, I go fishing. They followed him. And they went, they went up, back up to Galilee, on the Sea of Galilee, and they went fishing again because they had stopped proclaiming Jesus and went back to fishing. Part of it was because of fear. Because they were afraid. Because they saw what happened to Jesus. They saw the mobs. They saw all of the a danger involved in being a Christian in Israel in those days. And they went right back up and went back up there and went fishing. The fear caused them to become silent, to become speechless. Let me ask you something. Have you ever had an opportunity to share the gospel with somebody, to talk to somebody about Jesus, or just to do the easiest thing in the world, just to invite somebody to come to a church service? Well, that's not sharing the gospel. That's not witnessing. But, hey, it's a step. It's one step. Just invite somebody to come to church. And all of a sudden, you thought to yourself, well, what, what, if, what if they get angry? What if they get upset? What if they don't like what I'm asking them? What if they don't want to talk about this? And you know what? What makes you think that way? Fear. Fear of being rejected. Fear of being ostracized. Fear of being ridiculed, fear of being talked to in a mean way, fear of somebody looking at you in a, with a mean face. <laughs> whatever the fear is, fear of getting in trouble, whatever it may be, God says, fear not. I'll make you fishers of men. I'll give them, help you catch people for the Lord. Catch them with the gospel. Fear of people can cause you lots of problems, folks. Fear of people can cause you lots of problems. Proverbs 29, verse 25 says, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. The fear of man bringeth a snare. Don't be caught in this trap of fear, because the Bible says, Fear not, fear not. Don't become speechless because of fear. Let's keep going. Here's an interesting one. Faint not. I've never fainted in my life. I've, I've come close to passing out or fainting, but I've never actually fainted that I know of. Uh, has anybody here ever fainted? Oh, several. Okay. 
So you know what it's like. You know what it feels like. I don't. Fainting and passing out must be a scary thing, though, especially when you wake up and you realize that you just passed out. That's scary. Um, I've known, I've been with people who passed out. I've seen it happen a lot of times, but I've never had it happen to me. But there's another kind of fainting, isn't there? When you give up, you quit, you stop. If you the Bible, you follow this instruction in 2 Corinthians about faint not, you won't become satisfied with your life. It's a different kind of faint. Let me show you what I'm talking about. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. If you look at verse 1, Paul tells the church at Corinth in verse chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Now, I, tell you, I know it's not the full context, so it's up to you to read it. But he's saying God's the one who's called us. God's the one who sent us to do this. God's the one who's given us an instruction, this calling in life, to, and I'm, I'm willing to obey him. And because God's the one who sent me to do this, God's the one who called me, I will faint not. I will not quit. I'll not give up. No matter how hard it gets. Even when people don't like it, I'm still going to do it. I'm not going to faint. I'm not going to quit. Look at verse 16. Chapter 4, verse 16. Paul says, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, even if I'm killed and I die, or something like that, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. You know, God gives us strength. To keep going for him. To not faint. Not quit. Not give up. Sometimes we faint or we quit or we give up because we're not serving Jesus. We're serving ourselves. We're serving our sin. We're serving for stuff. That stuff could be uh, recognition, popularity, because the preacher expects it because people at church expect me to do it. Whatever it may be, we don't serve for the right reason. We're not serving our Savior. We're not serving Jesus. We're serving for the wrong reason. If you're serving for the wrong reason, you will faint. You will stop. That's why I tell missionaries, and I told Don and this when they first started, this is very important to all Christians, not just missionaries going to another country. If you're going there for any other reason if you're serving for any other reason except this reason that God has put that in your life God is behind it God has instructed you God has called you God has sent you whatever it may be but God if, it, if God's not behind it you're doing it for some other reason you will faint you will stop you will give up when it gets hard when it gets difficult you will quit. And you can't do anything but quit because it's not God who is empowering you to do it. You're doing it yourself. So be careful. Make sure that God's called you. Make sure God's sending you. Make sure God has instructed you to do it. These, the last part of chapter 4, verse 16 in 2 Corinthians, there's a, a phrase that we need to look at real quick before we move on. He says, the inward man is renewed day by day, every day. That inward person, we call it the heart, call it the soul, call it your spirit, however you want to call it. But the inward man, the inward person is strengthened, renewed, refreshed, given fresh desire, fresh get up and go every day. I know some people might say, well, preacher, you got it made. You're the preacher. Right? <clears throat> Life's not easy for preachers no more than it is for you. No. We have no, preachers have no special exemption from trials and problems and temptations no more than you do. No. We're all on the same boat. Sometimes I feel like that boat's sinking. 
but it's really not. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't throw in the towel. Serve because we want to serve Jesus. One more. You ready? No, two more. Sorry. But the last one's so short I forgot about it. Forsake not. Some people feel like they're forsaken sometimes, but you don't have to feel that way when it comes to God. This will keep you from becoming a shipwreck Christian. A shipwreck. How many, how many ships or boats that hit the reefs or crash into the rocks are able to be used again? How many do you think? How many? Probably aren't many, are there? Most, once, once that happens to a boat or a ship, it's usually finished, right? Last year, uh, my wife and I bought a little John boat. A little skinny John boat. I wish it were wider now. It's only 31 inches wide at the bottom. So it's real skinny. It's 14 feet long. It's a little bitty boat. And that thing was so full of holes, I told Brother Steve and Miss JJ, it had so many holes in it, it wouldn't float. It would sink. I mean, it just leaked everywhere. Water just gushed into that thing. The back end of it, the bottom of the back end was so beat up. It was so, and so thin, I don't know how it ever stayed together. It was a lot worse shape than I thought it was. But I got a great deal, because <laughs> I got it cheap. I got a boat, a motor that didn't run, that was blown up, and a, a trolling motor that was no good, and a trailer that all the, the bearings were locked up in it and had been rusted together and it wouldn't turn. I got a great deal. I paid too much for it, <laughs> as I used to do everything. But I used, I, I had to get me another trailer. The motor's no good, I can't use it. The trailer motor's no good, I can't use it. But I still got a boat, not much of one. And I worked on it and worked on it. When I was off for heart surgery, that's what I did. When I got up strong enough to do something, that's, I started working on that boat. And I had it almost finished before I went back to work. I worked on it every day. And I worked on that poor boat and it, it turned into a boat that floats. It does not leak. It'll float now. It'll even hold water. <laughs> All right. But you know, sometimes we feel like we're in a sinking boat in this life. And we feel like we've been forsaken. There's a verse in the Bible that talks about being forsaken. Being forsaken. Hebrews chapter 10. But it's not God forsaking you. It's us forsaking God. This verse says. Hebrews 10 25. Paul gives instruction. To the Hebrews. I believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. And he says. Not forsaking. The assembling of ourselves. Together. Talking to Christians. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Do you know what this verse is talking about? You know what its context is? He's talking about the assembling of Christians. When do Christians assemble? When do we come together? What's our custom? As the custom of Sunday is. What's our custom? Sunday. Yeah. Sunday at 10 o'clock. Sunday at 11 o'clock. Sunday at lunch. <laughs> Sunday afternoon at 1.30 or whenever we get back over here. Usually before, sometimes after. But we come back in the afternoon. Wednesdays at 6.30. We assemble, don't we? We assemble. We come together as an assembly. We come together as a group. We don't come together to listen to the preacher because I know that there's nobody comes to this church because they want to hear me. But we want to hear something from God's word, don't we? We want to hear from God's word. And I hope you don't come here because you want to hear me because if you do, you won't come long. You won't come long. It's like serving. You, you, if you're not serving for the, for the sake of the Lord, you won't serve long. Don't come to church because of the preacher. I don't care if it's me or any other preacher or any other church. Because it won't last. 
that preacher or somebody's going to disappoint you, somebody's going to upset you, somebody's going to do something you don't like. It's going to happen. It's happened to me. It's going to happen to you. Don't do it for anybody except the Lord. But he says that this verse is talking about the assembling of Christians. Forsake not the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is and so much the more, or excuse me, but exhorting one another, and so much the more. What's that mean? As the day, as we see the day approaching, the day that the Lord's coming back. That day, as you, you know, it's getting closer and closer. So what should we be doing? We should be attending the assembly of Christians more and more and more, more frequently, more often, more faithfully, more, more consistently. We should be assembling together more and more and more, not less and less and less. Amen? Yes. Don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Don't forsake being faithful in church. Amen? Can I... Uh, we went to Miss Nora's funeral yesterday, Miss Nora Shepherd's funeral. We went to the graveside service and uh, attended that part, and then Miss Glenn and I came back here and we worked until late in the afternoon uh, on the buildings. And um, how many of you have been over the fellowship building and saw the new tables? Been over there? I mean, if you haven't been over there, go see them. We put, we put new tables in the fellowship building. Miss Glenn and I put them in yesterday. And uh, yeah, got to go see them. Well, you weren't here last week, so you didn't hear about it. Because Leo laid out of church. He wanted to go for a helicopter ride instead. He wants to lay it out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> laid out. <laughs> laid out literally, right? Oh, boy. You got to come up with better excuses to miss church, brother. <laughs> a little old thing like a, you know, heart not wanting to work right. That's. <laughs> I'm picking up. Seriously, though. Um, we shouldn't forsake church. But something dawned on me yesterday. The Lord was really working in my heart several things yesterday. And, and uh, it doesn't always happen that way, but yesterday it did. And, and the Lord was really convicting my heart about several things in my life. And, and uh, but all of a sudden the Lord just kept feeding me these, this information. Folks, listen carefully. And I'm, I'm not preaching. I'm just sharing something from my heart for you that the Lord's been doing in my heart. You know why a lot and, and listen carefully now you know why a lot of church kids church kids kids who grow up in church okay you know why a lot of church kids when they're not kids anymore they don't go to church anymore they don't live for God you know why can I share with you the biggest reason? The biggest. Now, everybody's going to say the same thing I say. Well, when they get to be adults, they have to make their own choice. They, it's their decision. Correct. Correct. But you know what? The biggest excuse they use for not serving God, not living for God, not being in church when they become adults, the biggest excuse they're going to use is inconsistency. You know it. I know it. I've never been absolutely, perfectly consistent in my Christian life. Neither have you. All right? Neither have you. We've all failed. We've all stumbled. We've all said one thing and done another at one time or another. And I'm ashamed of it. And I know you are too. We're all, we're all the same. It just means, it doesn't give us an excuse to say, well, we're not perfect, we're not sinless. I know that. It's not an excuse. We don't just get to excuse it and say, ah, it doesn't matter. No, it matters. It matters. But we can't always say, well, those kids just had to make up their own decision, make up their own mind. We can't use that and just to cancel it off as not being important. Because we had an influence in our kids' lives. We did. And we need to take ownership for that. Matter of fact, it'll help our kids if we will. All right? One of the best things we can do 
instead of continuing in that road of inconsistency of what, what I mean go to church set church say one thing in church be a one person at church and then another person at home another person at work another person on vacation things like that do you see what I'm, where I'm going see I'm as human as you are and I know how this works you do too. We say one thing at church and then we go home or we go on vacation or we go somewhere else and we are another person. Inconsistency. The kids see it. The grandkids see it. And what happens? Absolutely zero respect for that Christian adult who had that influence in that young person's life. Zero zero respect not willing to follow that adult not willing to submit to that adult not willing to agree with that adult because no respect and the sooner we take ownership for that and admit it and not just admit it to self but admit it to the kids you see what i'm talking about this is real serious the sooner we sit down with those adults now, or young adults, or whatever they may be, whatever age they are, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Miss Betty, how old is your oldest kid? Um, she's 55. It doesn't matter if your kid's 55 years old. It doesn't matter. Sit down with them and say, I know I failed you. I know I should have been more consistent as a Christian. I should have been more faithful in church. I shouldn't have used every excuse to miss church. I should have kept you in church in the right way. Not say, we're going to church today. Get up. That's not how you keep kids in church, is it? No. You go to church with the right attitude for the right reason, and you show them that you love the Lord in your life. You show them you love the Lord, right? But go to them and talk to them and say, I messed up. I really failed you. And I, I'm sorry, but I'm not just saying I'm sorry. Will you please forgive me for not being a better mom or a better dad or a better grandma or a better, better grandpa? Will you please forgive me? Don't continue to be a stumbling block for the younger generation. Don't continue that. Stop it. That way, they now their excuses don't work. They need to realize they're not going to get away with using their excuses all their life. Now they're going to have to answer to God. Because now they have no excuse. Because if they're willing to forgive you for failing them, and we've all failed our kids, folks. We've all failed our kids. Preacher included. And the sooner you can sit down with them and say, please forgive me. Will you please forgive me for doing that? And please don't don't make the same mistake I made. Amen? Yes, amen. It's a good thing to say to your kids and mean it from your heart. Mean it from your heart. You will be surprised how much more respect you can earn. And I say earn because respect has to be earned. You don't demand it. You don't command it. You don't just expect it and get it. You've got to earn it. You'll be surprised how quickly you can earn some respect back from your kids if you'll just be honest and straightforward and humble yourself before them. Amen? Yes. Amen. We don't want to continue down the same road because of our pride, because we don't want to admit it. I've had to do it. I've done it with my kids many times because it seems like Miss Martha, even though I ask them to forgive me once, I still, my conscience still bothers me. And I still want to go and ask them again. Miss Barbara, you ever feel that way? I do. I do. Miss Diana, I, a lot of times I want to say, I know I've asked you to forgive me for this before, but I still feel so bad about that. I'm so sorry that I did that. I'm so sorry I didn't. Wasn't more consistent as a dad. I'm so sorry I like to lose my temper. And I'm, you know, we've all been there, haven't we? Yes. Yeah. Your kids will love you. And respect you a lot more if you'll just be strict with them. 
forsake not. Last one is not one that you can do. It's a fail not. Fail not. Only the Lord can do this one. As I said, I tried to be humorous and I said only the Lord can tie this knot. Okay? You can't do it. You need this knot in your life, but you need God to do it for you. Okay? When you're trying not to fall, and I'm trying to remember all these words, I've got to read them. Not to fall, not to fret, not to forget, not to fear, not to faint, not to forsake. You need all these knots in your life. Remember that Jesus will never fail you. What a blessing that is. He will never fail you. Because he'll never fail you, he can help you to never fail. Fail not. Amen? Would you stand with me, please? Father, thank you for these dear folks. Thank you so much for your precious word and your precious spirit indwelling every believer. Father, I don't know the hearts of anybody in this room except my own. And I ask that as you know our hearts, as you look into each heart, you will convict the hearts of anyone who might not be saved yet and, and convict the hearts and comfort and give whatever is needed in the hearts of those who are saved already to follow you and to put these, these knots in their life, to take these Bible knots and apply them to life every day. Help us, Lord, to realize you are the one who will help us not fail because you never fail. We thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for being willing to love us who are so unlovable. We praise you in Jesus' name. Before we say amen, before we finish praying, with every head bowed and every eye closed, just for a moment, I'd like to ask you, has God worked in your heart today about anything particular, anything? You don't have to tell me. Don't confess anything to me. Confess it to God. What's he spoken to your heart about today? What is it you need to make right? What is it you need to correct? What is it you need to put in your life or get something out of your life? Only you know. If you need to trust Jesus as your Savior and need to get saved today, please listen to the Lord. He's the one convicting our hearts. Let's obey him. Father, whatever it is you need to do in our lives, whatever work you need to accomplish, I just pray that each of us right now will be willing to say yes to you, willing to submit to whatever work it is you want to do in each of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Brother Ricky, would you hit that for me? God bless you, folks. We really appreciate you. Thank you so much for being so patient.